um, we can have a bit of old interest, new interest, and all, all the good stuff. We haven't had anybody new join for oh, minutes now. So we'll start, if you don't mind, and I'll share a screen, and I'll share Google Earth. And, oh, oh, now we've got somebody, we've got Chris coming in. Um, I'll share Google Earth and say, this is some nice new bathymetry that Rob Claxton has done for us. He's done some clever work with the mapping that we showed from DEFRA. Um, DEFRA had done, well, through various agencies, had done some sounding off the coast. Um, I'm just going to mute Chris because it makes him easier to cope with. <laughs> and I've just muted anybody who is making a noise, which has been a bit mean, but I can, I can be megalomaniac-ish. So the, the new bathymetry is excellent. Um, nicely detailed out to about a kilometer from the coast. So this is a, this blue bit here is a roughly kilometer wide strip. So great for shore diving. And all this information was made available by DEFRA on their website. But um, Rob quite, actually quite and evidently accurately thought he could make it look better and has. And so as per the instructions in the Sea Search group, you can have his hill shaded bathymetry to download as an overlay on top of Google Earth. And so you can see, we're looking down now on the Rosalie. And this oh, somebody, somebody's waiting, I'm just letting somebody in. Uh, we're looking down on the Rosalie and it's both hill shaded, so it casts a shadow and that helps you see raised areas. And it's colored by depth, so darker bits are deeper deeper bits are darker and shallow bits are brighter. So there you can see the three boilers on the Rosalie in a row. And you can actually even see the engine as yellowish behind it. And you can see just how intact the Rosalie is. We'll go on to some pictures in a moment, um, just to run round the Rosalie, just in case anybody hasn't seen it on a nice day or you want a bit of a virtual dive. We also have three Rosalie videos on our YouTube channel, and they're another nice way of reliving past glories. So what you can see here is that the Rosalie has a long front deck, and people normally swim to the middle, but that's a 50 meter swim. And if people are tired, if you know you're heading dead north, you can drop onto the front deck, which is what I generally do now. So what I'll do is I'll, I have to stop this share, but I'll start another one. Hello, it's us. I'll start another one and that'll be, hopefully, oh, I've got a thousand different things. Where's Picasso gone? It did this to me before. Oh, there it is. There's Picasso. Um, I'm just gonna share a gallery of pictures with you. And look first at the Rosalie selection. and run through a slideshow of that. Not because um, it's, it's vital, but this is the bit you'd normally arrive at. So you can see this is the, the front bow of the Rosalie, which comes up to within in three meters of the surface quite easily, and in probably two meters of the two surface, meters. because it's, it's shallow, only about four meters deep down at the sort of where the the structure where the ribs resume because the, the shallower stuff's gone. Last year was, was pretty clear a lot of the time. So this is the start of the, I guess, the, the less tapered hull past the, the bows now. And hopefully you can see me moving the mouse about and you can see that the reason it looks like it was always a low boat is the sides of the hull fell off and now lie beside the wreck, um, forming a boulder plane that's got to be 40 odd meters wide in some places. Mm. It really is huge. Beautifully encrusted and always shallow, so you get lots and lots of, of algae growth. Um, 
this is that fallen piece at the outside and you can see how regular it is it's probably this it, these are the supports for the uh, next next deck up or something um oh, that's nice. <clears throat> oh thank you very much <laughs> So the thing that always strikes people is how well encrusted at limited depth the Rosalie is. And that keeps it a focal point for other fish. So we get good shoals of fish flashing around over the wreck. And unfortunately, that brings in anglers as well. So we get a lot of angling debris drifting in. And we have had some fishing debris, lost pots, and even the idiot amateur potters as, as well last year but it's a nice boat. This front section's getting very holy, but more worryingly towards the back of the boat. Um, there are certainly plenty of areas that you can you know, set off on its own. There's plenty of areas where you could potentially penetrate the wreck. And I really want to discourage that because somebody's going to get stuck in it and it's going to, it's going to spoil it for everyone if you meet somebody who's been down there for more than a day. <laughs> Um, but like I say, I mean, super picturesque. You can see there's plenty of sponges, anemones, and we get soft coral, dead men's fingers as well. And the wreck has was scoured out in the last couple of years, so it's so just boulders rolled in on top and not packed with sand like it it can be sometimes. Um, I'd like to tell people just not to take animals off off the wrecks. It's easy. It's far too easy and it creates a terrible impression for um, divers in general against the local fishermen who've got a real axe to grind. Um, I've had sort of words with the local spearfishers as well um, because I'm not desperately keen on that but uh, because again we get nice big resident ballon wrasse like this which are pretty friendly and that makes them easy to spear and easy to hit although this year we've had quite a lot of pollock these are these are bass but we've had pollock as well towards the back and that seemed to be what the spear fishermen were really going for here's a couple of crabs caught in a just a, a slice of monofilament that's been lost from something else and the, the crabs can't get out of that at all um, we get cork wing wrasse about and they really are beautiful they've been getting better and better the last few years and the resident ones are often the males that are leading a harem. Um, so they're, they're nice to catch around the wreck. Yeah, I think, I think it was probably 2017, Chris and I took off a big old chunk of rope from the front and I did quite a lot of rope and net last year. And I know that Mark Crane brought lots of stuff back. And I think really need to hammer it in to anybody who goes past um, to be careful about what you take off. You don't want to be removing live animals. Nearly all the stuff in the piece of net there is dead. Um, and we were taking it off to recover to the beach so we could free them because it was just taking us too long to try to free individual crabs, although most of those are dead and it stank formidably. And that tells the story as well. That's crisp with a handful of bits of fishing rod just everywhere. Further on to the wreck, um, the upper deck and the lower decks are more distinct and you can see the way the life graduates with the, the light on top encouraging algae and the channeling of water encouraging other things to grow. We've got quite a lot of sponges inside. I left this picture in because I'm sure it's a recurring, recurring thing that people have noticed, these spikes that form on pieces of thin material out of the wreck. Uh, I think almost every year I go around and try and knock those off with a, a flint. But they, they reform and they will reform. So keep an eye out, but not literally. Um, once you get to the middle, you get onto the boilers and the boilers are spectacular. But last year, they, the water was pumping through them. And so the area around the engine had pretty poor visibility. I was on one dive where silt was streaming out of the boilers. And I wonder whether, I mean, whether this is a thing that will be cyclic or persistent. Um, maybe it's just the direction of flow. It might be that the boilers will start to clear out and they might collapse if they have to support more of their own weight. 
Um, here again, the boilers are high bits, so you've got fantastic algal growth. Green stuff is always a telltale that you've got lots of light, and this red stuff is tassel weed or Calibrifaris ciliata, eyelash weed. Sometimes. Beautiful eyelash weed. Beautiful eyelash weed, according to the book. Um, sometimes you see a lobster in there, and again, you can see the massive amount of silt that's collected. So, I mean, I wonder whether some years the stuff pushes up and it just gets caught in these like traps. You can see there, this was the dive where the silt was pumping out. It's just streaming out of the bottom of the, the boiler. I and mean, perhaps there was a new fracture and the water was coming through. Now, obviously there's lots of life, lots of crabs, lots of lobsters about. And the best bit, I guess, for seeing wreckage is down at the back on the, the western side where you get a big wall. Um, inside, we've had sort of fantastic shoals. Oh dear, we've lost Chris. Ah well, <laughs> he's gone flat. Which isn't like him because <laughs> if, as long as he can't hear, he'll tell you he's, he's a chesty chap. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so these are red mullet and we had a, a good shoal of red mullet, although they disappeared early in the season. I think perhaps they're easy to catch or easily bored and we lost them. The engine is a nice piece of, sort of landmark and so the two remains of, sort of standing, I think, valve work above the block are what gives it its presence. Um, fantastic fish life there. There have been wrasse, bib almost persistently shoaling around that part of the wreck. And that's another cork wing wrasse. Behind the engine, you get the prop shaft. I'm sure you're all familiar with the prop shaft. Um, heads back across the deck. And again, these long, low girder-like pieces, I'm sure have been undercut because I'm sure- they Used to be almost flat, didn't they? Yeah, they've been almost level. And another giveaway that this is recent is there's not much growing here, whereas normally the decks are live with stuff. It used to be sheets of anemones, didn't it? Yeah. The, the so ones. Yeah, so I think that's taken this material out. Mm. These boxes underneath the prop shaft are beginning to look a bit deformed to me. Mm. Um, some of them are really starting to cave in, probably under the weight of the prop shaft itself, which looks to be solid, and also where I think the propellers moved in the last couple of years, or maybe last five years now. Because I'm sure it was over in an open deck and then three so or so years ago it came over and now it's lodged against one of those um, prop supports. Probably when we had that big storm. You think during the, the tides, the surge? Yeah, possibly. The, I mean, the, the prop is difficult to appreciate most days because often you can't see quite across it and this wasn't super clear. So you can see the mush in the water. But looking down, you can see that it is starting to break up the deck underneath it and lodge against these supports. So I think eventually it's going to sink fully into the, the deck. And some people say, oh, well, it's nice to be up at deck level, but I'm pretty sure this is the engine room floor, which is why the debris field is so wide because this is a floor no one would ever have walked past. You can't imagine Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio strolling the deck and going, oh, look, an eye level prop shaft, because <laughs> this would have been down below the waterline, otherwise the propeller wouldn't have worked very well. But nice to be able to see, and a spectacular piece of ironwork. Presumably the original bronze main propeller was, was taken away, but this old iron propeller wasn't considered to be a, a good piece of um, scenery, or a good, good piece of salvage, and so it was taken away. I really should check in a minute that we're, we're not missing anyone, so I'll just come out of this, this show, we'll resume in a moment, just need to check, yeah, so I've not got anybody new to let in. To let in go back to that now. Um, oh, it started again, that's annoying. I will click annoyingly through all of these to get on. That really shouldn't have happened. 
Sorry about that. At the beginning of these talks, people tend to be slow to, to arrive and log in and I don't really want to um, have them waiting around because with this type of share, I can't see the people who are trying to dial in. I'm sure it, this, this is clearly not the best way to do this. But at least it lets you relive the last few moments. It's not many more to go now. No, we're nearly there. Um, we'll go around the back of the boat because last time we did this talk, I mentioned that so one of the, the reasons for going to the back is to see things like the bollards, the steering gear, and part of the steering gear, the rudder, which is quite, quite obvious down at the back of the boat. I think this is pumping through now. I'm just hoping it'll stop at a reasonable time. Uh, nearly there. Nearly there. That's about where you were. Yes. Yeah. I'm not clicking this anymore. <laughs> so. There it is. Okay. Now we've got to the back of the boat. And we've overshot horribly. That's the, the joy of this. There's, there's the rudder. Let me, let, let's. I'm really sorry. This is. <laughs> This has got its knickers in a twist and is running through. You can, at least you can see there's, there's going to be some nice stuff here. Anyway, let me take you back to where we were. That's it. Okay. Okay, well, let's let's deal in small pictures, perhaps, if I can't get this to display full screen. Well, that, that is such an annoyance. I think it doesn't want to start a slideshow mid, and it won't use its, oh yeah. Okay, so towards the back of the prop shaft, you can see there's a lot of scattered material. This is back at the back of the boat, just below or just before the keel section and the prop comes to an end oh, which I can't do with the same button oh oh this is mildly humiliating isn't it I'm sorry about this now I think this isn't going to play properly like this so well let's Let's do something different. So we've been mucking around with Zoom for a while and we'll go to another program whilst you say that other things at the front, which perhaps we won't spend as long talking about now, um, are sort of the sand planes as well as diving for the Rosalie. We dive Weyborn for the sand and you might think, why on earth would you do that? But it's filled on the right days in the latter part of summer with little cuttlefish, which are probably some of the really the best things you can see um, at um, off, off Norfolk. I and mean, they really are just a spectacular um, little animal. And quite honestly, the reason I dive a lot of the sites is for the wildlife. And the Rosalie is a fantastic setting for wildlife. It's sort of a place you can go to and you can find sort of slugs, anemones, and now these aren't ordered properly. Oh, that is, that is annoying. Okay, let us <laughs> swear politely and try to go on just with these, these small pictures because that way we can keep it under control. So at the end of the prop shaft, you find the steering quadrant. That's down from above but it sticks up above the seabed like this. And as you can see, because it's up in the main flow of the water, you get amazing growth of, growth of plumos anemones on it. You also get a whole load of rope, unfortunately, because it catches almost everything that go, goes past. And later on in this, we'll show um, a sort of a, the idea of what a potter thinks will let them place pots on the wreck. Um, 
Beyond the steering quadrant, which you can see there, there are a couple of bollards. They make a nice, sort of attractive front to it. Sometimes they've got more growth on than others. And they lead you out to the keel. So this is the keel. And if you imagine it was hung on that part. Rudder. Rudder, that's it. Well done. Um, hung on that part as a hinge and then swept to steer the boat. This is an interesting place to go out to, probably only about five to 10 meters from the stern of the wreck, and um, sometimes has interesting kinds of Faselina nudibranch on it. Um, it was Michael who discovered those, I think a couple of years ago. Back to the wreck, this was also where the Pollock liked to hang out. They seemed to enjoy the current and the, the overhead cover of the steering quadrant. So they were, were quite good fun. Um, and that was down at the eastern side of the stern of the boat, where unfortunately there was a real tangle of monofilament net, which took some freeing because it had caught up on some protruding bits of pipe work, I think. That was a bit annoying. The animals in it were all dead. Um, and I, I brought that back. Um, the Pollock didn't seem to mind too much. They followed me down the side of the wreck, but you can see I'd ruined the visibility by then by fighting with that, that piece of netting. Um, off the eastern side of the wreck, there's quite a bit of fallen superstructure. So it's harder to pick out the hull outline on that side of the wreck, but it's still there. It's just that upper parts of the wreck have fallen out and across. And in a moment, I'll show you um, the GPS outline and a new GPS outline we did more recently um, to show you where these things all occur. This is just nice stuff across the deck. This is back to the boilers again, down the east side with more of that beautiful eyelash weed. Um, Again, the boilers are a, a place where the bib tend to hang out. They like going underneath the prop shaft and around the boilers. And last year, they were accompanied for most of the year by some pots. And this was put in by I think, a young fisherman called Henry. And a fisherman told me, how can those horrible divers keep cutting Henry's pots free or tangling them up? and I said, Henry's an idiot. Henry keeps dropping these pots inside the wreck and the ropes, which he's put this hose pipe on to prevent them tangling, um, just tie around the engine. So he did this at least twice. And this was pretty close to where the amateur potter had added his, um, it was almost like a keep net, which, I mean, I think we shouldn't do that. And it's, if we must take them, we can just pick them up crabs and lobsters and I wouldn't um, because you're standing there in a grand's worth of gear why why do you need to pick up a couple of pounds worth of crab it's pointless um, so I explained or tried to explain to this guy that Henry was an idiot putting his pots inside the wreck um, if he had to he could put them outside the wreck but that the blue hose was doing him no good at all it didn't make me seem any nicer but there you can see it's a normal new pot. He was just dropping them into the wreckage and they were getting tied around the engine. Um, here's a last picture from the wreck gallery. And can you guess what these are? What's this, Dawn? It's a big bunch of squid eggs. It's a big bunch of squid eggs. So this isn't a display sort of that Durex have paid for. It's a whole load of squid eggs. And if you look closely, they're filled with tiny cylindrical eggs within each of these sausages. So that is thousands of squid eggs. Unfortunately, the squid, I quite like the cuttlefish, are quite nervous. They don't hang around, but the squid are so fast and so transparent, you rarely see them. I'll stop this share. And that means I can go back to seeing what's going on. Um, yep, nobody else has complained. So you can, you can chat in and send us questions or comments if you'd like. Um, we're half an hour in, so in the next 10 minutes, what I'm going to do is show you a little bit of some of the, um, 
Whoa, what do you call them? Some of the GPS tracks we've got from around the wreck. Ah. Is that the one I want? No, that's not the one I want. I don't want to show you that. Could have been worse. It could have been so much worse. Dawn is quite right. Is there another row below? This is the thing. Now I've got umpteen browser windows up and I think the browser window I want, ah, there it is. It's the one that says zoom on it. So it looks like zoom. Um, but lots of you will know there's a guide page to diving both the Rosalie and the Vera. And if you do a search for Norfolk's Twin Wreck Challenge, you'd find it. And that includes lots of advice on the layout of the wrecks and timing of dives and site practicalities. And it's also got these GPS tracks. Okay, so we've got 10 minutes left. These GPS tracks, both of the walk there and back, so you don't have to argue with people how far it is. It's about 400 meters to walk there or how far it is to swim out. It's about 200 meters or how long the wreck is. It's about 200 meters long. So all that can be settled easily. Um, also, there's some the guides to the layout and some sketches. So the wreck itself runs perpendicular to the shore. So if you're swimming out to it from the shore, um, you're swimming direct to the middle of the wreck and that's one of the reasons why you can drop early and you'll drop onto the foredeck. Um, lots of people like now to get in early and drift out. I think this wastes a lot of time and gets you cold but if you don't like the walk you can drift there and because we normally dive this at low tide the tide will carry you there as it falls and it'll carry you back as it rises so that's very neat. And it's the opposite of the Vera, which we dive at high tide and behaves nicely, carries you there and back on the two tides. The next one is the more recent plot I did with the help of Sasha. There you can see the inner outline really, really clearly, and also the fallen outline, which I was trying to get better captured and poor Sasha had to swim around the whole thing pulling um, uh, a GPS on a, a large surface marker boy so he did sterling work there. The wreck itself is something we we have annotated and is annotated on the page um, and if you click on it you get a larger picture which is you could point out or use for briefings and again you see the bow so the fairly intact sides of the front, although there's some material fallen outside, the line of boilers across the middle in front of the engine, then the prop shaft, and then that steering gear, the rudder, and this large amount of fallen structure outside to the east. Now the newer one, again, you can see we did circuits and GPS isn't a great way to draw things, although I have a, a fantastic friend in Scotland whose kids took the boat GPS out and used it to spell s swear words on a massive scale. He was very impressed. He didn't know they could spell. <clears throat> Excellent. Finally, on that page, there's a nice sketch. Um, not entirely up to date. But again, I mean, a good, good start if you wanted to, to run through it. I'll stop that share at that moment and say, oh, I've got a, a chat coming in. Uh, Rob has just let me know that he's got an interactive 3D model of the Rosalie made from the bathymetry, which he's happy to make available. Oh, cool. And I think rather than, rather than invite everybody to message Rob, um, I'd say yes. I'm sure there's lots of people who like it, and if he makes it, if he's able to make it available in the Sea Search East group, that would be great, and people can comment on it and and ask for help from from there on. Rob's been doing a massive amount of work on the rendering and appearance of the the bathymetry, and hopefully we'll make a lot of use that of that in the coming year if we're ever allowed out. I don't know if we'll be allowed out. 
Excellent. So what I'm going to do is we're coming up to five minutes left. So perhaps I'll bring up Google Earth. And whilst that's coming up, I'll say we'll run into a second session here. Nick has some information on a new anchor that was that he found whilst swimming past um, well, on the, the way to the Rosalie. So here's the Rosalie beaches over here. And you can see that there are other structures on the way. I think these things are sort of sand echoes of the wreck. They stretch over to the west as well. But these sand echoes aren't that obvious when you're swimming over them. But they don't, they're not rich in extra features. But inside, down here, there's often quite a good boulder plain with things growing on it. And as well as some landfall features, I think maybe they were there and there, of the sort of first wind farm. There are sort of good boulder plains which have extra bits of wreckage which may have rolled away from the Rosalie. And Nick has a thing which I'll ask him to show when we start our, our next session. If I move this up forward, you can see that the straight out of the car park you get sand and there's a big body of sand out there but just and I mean just to the east you're into chalk and that's in two bands and that's what we'll talk about after Nick's piece on the anchor if he's happy to do that and so rather than take this to the the bitter end I'll call a halt to that share and pop back and say hopefully you'll all be happy to pop back in. This is only the free version and it has a 40 minute cap. So rather than an ugly disappearance, and I'll just be saying, well, if you need to know where the gold is, it's, <laughs> um, we'll say we'll break it here. We'll aim to finish this chat in one more session. So Nick said his anchor piece would just be five minutes so you know what to look out for. Then we'll talk more about the reef on the eastern side and we've got a picture gallery of that and that'll involve dawn being clever and telling me more about the the animals and things growing there because it's a mixture of close-up pictures and some wide angle scenic pictures because the the reason for going to the reef is to go for the animals and one of the ways to appreciate the animals is to look close and that's what dawn does as as a, a specialism. Okay, so I'm going to stop this call now. Um, I'll tell you what, whilst this is going on, and because it will be funny, funnier than watching me, I'll spotlight Nick's video. So Nick will stick. Bye guys. Good grief. You've been, you've been trapped there for too long. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen it from the back. <laughs> oh, God, it's a mullet. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could work on a half decent man bun with that. <laughs> sadly, sadly, it could, but we're not going to do that for it. Because yeah. what, what about a French plat, Inga? <laughs> I think we tried that. We tried that. That's quite possible. Yeah, it's, there's enough there for a French plat. Yes. Uh, excellent. That, need... That's horrible. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for your support. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think it... uh, everything's fit. Okay, I think we're nearly all back in. I think we've got 12 of the 13 people and I could quite imagine that somebody thought I've had enough of this yammering <laughs> and has gone off for a, a wee but in fact that's immaterial let's say that are you happy to to do your piece Nick? Yeah well, I tell you what if you pop up your bathymetry just a minute just so I can try and pinpoint on it where where I think this thing is and then I'll share some pictures you can pop, pop me back on focus see if you can do that Okay. Look at that magic. Oh, that's magic. Yeah, so I think if you move your cursor to the right very slightly now, uh, yeah. keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, about there, about, about where you are now. Uh, so I'm, I'm a lazy di diver. I can't be bothered to do the walk with Rob. 
So we always go straight in off the water pipe and swim out about 50 to 75 meters and then swim on an angle to the, to the wreck underwater the whole way. Um, so we tend, this dive's about a two hour dive for us typically. <laughs> Um, and the anchor's about the third of the way down on the edge of the boulder field there, I think. If you come back to my screen now, Rob, I've got some pictures of what I believe it is. Um, okay, so I've got to stop sharing yeah, and then, then you'll it. be back. Um, that's it. So if, you share, that's it, so if you share, how do I share my screen? Yeah. You should have a share thing at the bottom. I have, I have. What yeah. might it be? If you cruise down to the bottom, hopefully you'd have the option to share. You'd say share screen. I have. I'm sharing now, I hope. Can you see something now? No. No, I'm, ju I'm just getting this really good view up your nose. Is <laughs> <laughs> oh, it good? Are you enjoying it? Yeah, can we have great two fingers, on. nose? <laughs> I see what we're doing. Is it because you've got him on spotlight video? Because uh, I've got to somehow get to the right screen here. Yeah. I think he can share whatever he wants from his end. Uh, it's just we've yeah, chosen to spotlight him. Oh, oh, you started sharing. Oh, yeah, excellent. The whole thing. And well, well, that's. Unfortunately, oh. I can't share what I want to share. Why can't I share what I want? To share? Yeah. What can, you an what can you see? Ah, uh -huh. good. Right. So. Very close to that. Right, so you can see that anchor, can you? Yeah. So that, that's what I believe, right, that's what I believe it is. They're interesting design. Um, they've got a couple of names. They're called flipper, flipper deltas or HYDs. Essentially, they're launched vertically as, as per the picture on the left-hand side. And it doesn't matter which way they fall. If you imagine that not being tilted but vertical no matter which way they fall they'll then dig in and they're specifically used for laying cables and pipelines um, and then they're recovered uh, hopefully this will come up over the back of the deck like this from a, a line that's actually secured to the bottom end so when it's launched it's got a chain on it going off to whatever you want to secure and on this other end there's a buoy so that when they come to retrieve, they go back, pick the boy up, pull the boy on board, and then recover the anchor over the aft deck. Um, the one down there, I think, is a half ton size, which is smaller than in these photographs. Um, and it's full of life. It's got a colony of um, pipe worm all, uh, fan worms all over it, lots of prawns, um, a lobster, uh, a lot of sponge, from, this is all from memory because unfortunately it was my first solo dive and I decided to keep it simple and not take a camera. Um, and it's right on the edge of the boulder field. So I think what, from the discussion we had before, Rob, this has probably uh, been lost when they were laying those cables that you pointed out on the bathymetry. Um, but that's it. And it's lying as seen on that aft deck there um, on the bottom. Yeah, so I think so that's all I've got to say. <laughs> Egg, egg, excellent. Neat, neatly it's done. Anchor. Thanks very much. Like I thought it, it was worth saying just because um, we perhaps really sort of don't, we need more things to see. It's nice to have more landmarks and sort of finding the odd, odd extra bit doesn't hurt. You're still seeing Nick's screen. Yes, I'm one. He needs to unshare. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm, I should be able to overpower yeah, Nick, for heaven's sake. <laughs> cool. yeah. I've, I've stopped sharing voluntarily. There you go. Yeah. Save you the trouble. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's interesting. While you were sharing, it seemed to have shuffled the controls. So I couldn't find a zap Nick, he's boring me button. Um, but as soon as you went back to just, just being sort of Nick and Inga at home, my controls came back. Yeah. See, I said that's and what happened. Gave away control, <laughs> Rob. Careful. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So, as as we were saying, if we go back to the bathymetry for a moment. Yeah. Have you seen someone's asked if any part of the Rosalie is snorkelable? Oh, yes. And which, do, which it is. <laughs> yes. So, well, let's answer the snorkel question first. Um, somebody said, is the Rosalie snorkelable? And it definitely is. Um, one of the, the things that makes it snorkelable is that it breaks the surface. I think 
with both wrecks, um, the Vera and the Rosalie, they, they both break the surface and that makes them on a, low tide. on a low tide, makes them practical to find and dive down to, which is not to say that once you knew where they were, you couldn't try them on a higher tide, um, just that you, you could bed yourself in and, and find them. There's lots of interest on the Rosalie and as well as the parts that break the surface, which are the top of the engine, which is around sort of the, the middle of the wreck, those, those yellow parts, when in fact the engine's just behind those, those are the boilers. And I think the Rosalie is quite a nice wreck to encounter because it's not nearly as sharp as the Vera. Mm. The Vera's shallow bits are really quite sharp and so you'd go down beside them and take care. Um, Although it'll be harder to find, certainly you could, once you've found the middle and got your bearings, you could certainly snorkel up the front quite easily. And that front bow piece, which looks very nice, um, is only four meters to the bottom. So there's a slope on this wreck from about four meters seabed here, uh, probably six or seven here, and 10 at the back. But all the way down, there are pieces which are standing pretty high so i think the gear at the back is probably standing three four meters high the engine is standing six seven meters high off the seabed and that bow section is standing up probably three meters at most depending on how well it's undercut and scoured away excellent so that's one lot of stuff you can snorkel and there's a boulder plane. The boulder plane underlies this whole area and the sand moves on a yearly basis. So often there's a boulder plane which leads up to the bow and I've seen um, 50 caliber mm -hmm. shells in there intact. I should have picked them up, but it's really safer that I didn't. Um, and one of the odd things about the dive is you come back and because this beach is so steep, you can be at three meters very close to the beach. So you need to be aware of all the fishing or angling gear as you come back in. Now you can't really very well see the sort of old sort of gun emplacement and sort of concrete beef, uh, beach fixtures here from the war, but what you can see is how close the chalk is here. So this area of chalk is, you can see literally, I mean, 20 30 meters off the beach so that's snorkelable and if you wanted to and you can dive it lots of people have had have spent an hour in here um, or you can snorkel out and know that so long as you've gone beyond the start of the cliffs you'll be able to dive into chalk this chalk is quite well abraded by the sand it's in sort of the wave zone really so there's heavy sand action across here and this isn't particularly well encrusted it's quite interesting there's often lots of crabs around but if you cross this sandy area which is another uh, sort of 7500 meters you're onto a much bigger area of chalk uh, it's probably worth saying that shallower stuff is often full of angling tackle as well so you'd have to be quite careful if you're going to snorkel it. That, that's a, a good point there's the, the anglers just throw a massive amount of gear in um our angling friend mark crane tells us it's because they're using the wrong gear and i say well that doesn't make it any better the fact that they're idiots in one way um, it can only be improved by them not throwing stuff in. I, I, don't, I don't really care whether it's wrong or right. The fact that it's on the bottom makes it wrong. But as you can see, the chalk proper starts here. Um, beyond this sand area, which can seem a bit daunting if you're setting off from the inner chalk, you get onto the outer chalk, which is really quite, uh, quite good. It's probably a metre high in places um, and much better encrusted with life because it's not so heavily abraded by the sand. And as you see, if you get to that sort of point, you can actually cross all the way on on chalk and again interestingly that bit is actually visible from the google earth picture so if i turn off the nice bathymet oh, yeah. bathymetry overlay you can actually see that through the picture and when mm -hmm. we started looking at the chalk um, 10 plus years ago um, we used these pictures as a guide for areas of interest and as you can see it, that's exactly what they are so let's have a look at some nice pictures of chalk and I'll try not to foul it up like I did before. Uh, somebody else who's seen the anchor. Oh, 
Okay, so I want to move that to one side. We've got Andy Kirk. I've also seen this anchor and would agree. Excellent. Well, yeah, I've been dived. No, who knows how many times there, and I've never seen this anchor. So perhaps it is pretty recent, but it sounds as though it's. Mm. No? I think it's crossed. Yeah. No. Not recent? Not recent. Probably, uh, it must have been probably five years ago I seen it. Okay, well, that might put it, I mean, that would put it with the first lot of cables. Could be, it? could be with the first lot of cabling. So that, that is recent. We looked at whether it might be to do with the communications cable that, it's not that, that comes that, in. That anchor, design, that anchor design was developed in the 80s, by the way. Yeah. It's relatively I thought it looked like a modern design of anchor. And the, the cable, the communication, or a cable, was apparently laid in in 1989. So that's, that's a possibility. Um, yeah, although, could although the cable that comes in to the marker on the beach is in such poor condition it seems almost inconceivable it's that recent but perhaps that's what happens to cables anyway or perhaps they perhaps that's an old cable and they've laid in another one along the same line and that was was what was happening and that's why there was there was cable kind of business going on anyway let's have a look at some more pictures and I'll try to make sure that this doesn't get carried away again. Oh, Chris is back. Oh, I, battery. I've let, I've let Chris back in. <laughs> Hopefully he won't be too much of a problem. Um, I'll just try and get this slideshow to go full screen. And you know, what's this? Um, this is one of the many fishing weights oh, yeah. that mm -hmm. the people have found. We have round weights. Um, ones with spikes sticking spiky weights um, teardrop, shape, teardrop weights all, all kinds of weights that really so, lovely Victorian one we've got somewhere lovely yeah <laughs> anyway sort of the the inner stuff often the visibility is pretty poor and the encrustation is quite low so this must have been during a quiet period um, when there were some tiny plumos and enemies able to grow on it but this is what the inner chalk looks like on a, a good day. So you can see it's low stuff. It's quite brown. It's almost like diving in Dorset. It's so beige. And you can see there's not much growing on it, even though it's very shallow in mean, five meters or three meters. Yeah. From three meters, um, the algae can't quite get started just because it's always being beaten back by the sand. But again, there's animals in it, and the bib like to buzz around underneath. So everybody likes bib, mm. except to eat, because they taste horrible. Um, as you get a bit further out, you can see we've got some light seaweed getting going, and a lobster walking past. The lobsters hunt over these areas, um, and can have quite a big range. The bigger the lobster, the bigger the range it would have. Um, flounder? Place. Place. Well, it's not very orange for a place. It's not, but I can see the spots starting. <laughs> no, one can see the spots. So, yeah, you get lots of wildlife on Ooh. this inner area. Um, these are um, light bulb sea squirts. Um, as you can see, growing very low on that, that stuff. And then low spits of chalk with animals trying to hold on and so we're working out here um, there's fingers of chalk as you could see on the bathymetry so running out perpendicular to the shore quite low to start with um, but building up and as you can see the chalk lays down in plates and these pots under here are great for looking for prawns the prawns are like being in there they'll dance around for you clean your hands um, you could even try and do that tropical thing where people just sit there with their mouths open. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is poo. It is. It is literally poo. <laughs> and when you leave the inner close shore chalk, you've got a lot of sand to get across. So I thought, no point not providing you with some interest here. <laughs> and there are two kinds of lugworms. There's one that does sand-coloured poo, and there's one that does black poo. 
and I'd do the names, but I think honestly, we're not going to get everybody to remember them. But they are Arenicola worms, and it's Marina that does sand color. That does sand color. I was going to say that, and Diphodians does black poo. Well done. So there you are. Um, being so close in shore, you get angling line, and this is a dead crab that was caught and died in angling line. And I've been there on days when I've brought back. I mean, two to three kilos of lead weight and hundreds of meters of line. Um, so bring it back if you can. Try not to kill anything. Try not to kill yourself. I find it's best if you can take a bag and that way you can stuff the stuff away because often these, the bits that are left are mackerel feathers and they've got lots of, hooks. yeah, just loads and loads of little horrible rusty hooks in. And they tangle. It's difficult enough getting out them out of the bag afterwards, but you don't want to get them out of your fingers. And here's a bit of horn rack. Oh. And this is a bryozoan, one of Dawn's nice pictures. And in a minute, we've got another bryozoan picture, and we'll show you why this isn't seaweed, because it's got little animals using it as a structure to live in. They make it themselves, um, and they are a huge or a hugely numerous colony. Not a big colony. Nice top shell. And we've got a, a painted top shell there as well. Um, this is a carpeting sea squirt. This is Diplosoma spongiform with worms in, sand masons. No, they're not. Oh, there are some sand masons, sorry. Yeah, the big obvious ones are sand masons, and the little ones are Polydora worms. So you can look out for those. This is a nice one. I'll let Dawn name this one. Uh, this is a, another bryzo, and this is Bauerbankia citrina, and it's called citrina because it's yellow like a lemon. There, memorable or what? <laughs> so it's very closely related to that horn rack we just saw, but you can see it looks completely different. And that's the problem with bryzoans, they're cute. Um, here's a squirt. This is a club squirt. And what's this one called this year? This one's Mochelia margus currently. Still Mochelia margus. <laughs> um, so this one, if you look at it closely, it's got lots of spots, little red spots. So more spots than the other kind, which only has one. Yes. Excellent. Once you're on, I mean, once you're back to my pictures, you don't have to just look at one animal at a time. But you can see this is a great area for looking for sea scorpions. Um, <laughs> this is the long spined. You can tell it's got a little white tassel by its mouth and a big spike there. Um, and they seem happiest when the, the seaweed has started to set in because they're just lost in that. And they ambush things and hang around trying to, to frighten you. I thought this was a sponge with bryzoan in it. I think you're right. I think it's um, it's goosebump sponge, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. We, we won't spend too long. We're not doing an ID evening. We're just showing there's lots of nice things mm. and they're interesting and encrusting, very heavily encrusting. This is a bryzoan. It's a piece of finger bryzoan. And this is really like a horrible piece of KFC chicken, which, <laughs> well, it's pretty horrible on its own anyway, but it looks like a horrible piece of KFC chicken. Um, but when you zoom in, Oh, yeah. you can see all these little sort of umbrellas or shuttlecocks and those are the individual animals that are living in the mass that makes up apparently the whole animal so this is a colony this is a finger or jelly bryozoan so it's all wobbly and horrible um, but there are thousands of these little animals in here and they feed by catching stuff in these little shuttlecocks. So it looks like a coral polyp, but this is actually a lot more complicated. You can say that again. Okay, crossing the sand, you might get a bit of exposed seaweed. This is Gracilaria. It's got to be growing on something. So the chalk isn't very deep, but there's almost always what they call a veneer of sand here. And it could be you know, six inches plus. because This is a long weed, but it'll hold on um, after growing out when it's been able to get a purchase while being uncovered. Next picture is a nice um, compass jellyfish. I'm sure everybody loves jellyfish. 
And again, mm. it's a thing to look for <laughs> as you cross the sand. Very nice photographically in the last couple of years. A nice clean jellyfish against the sun, ready to sting you in the face. Mm -hmm. And a starfish. There you are, a <laughs> highlight of the sand. But eventually you get to the outer chalk and then you'll be on to sort of more seaweed, more animals, and this kind of encrusting. And you can see the place is sort of almost um, it's almost jungly, almost upside down. The ground is covered in things. And these are more bryozoans, these little golden trees. These are bugular. Yeah, spiral bryozoans. Excellent. Um, and where you get bryozoans and hydroids, you get nice um, slugs. This is a nice one of Dawn's slugs. And this is a genolus. And it's now antiopella. Oh, yes, of course. It's antiopella. I forgot last time as well. So antiopella. And this one's glassy clear, and you can see its digestive tract carrying the poisons it gathers from what it eats up into the end. Nice picture. And this one's a, what's it, a leucocelinia sponge? Yes. So a little sponge made of tubes. So most sponges are full of holes. This, <laughs> this <laughs> is holes made of long <laughs> holes. This is holes <laughs> surrounded by sponge. So isn't that tricky for you? Um, more encrusted Ooh, rocks nice. and you can see these are only probably by now about six meters deep so you can go out and spend loads of time on time on them they're a good place to look for slugs and all the other usual animals um this is boring sponge which of course isn't boring is it chris you probably muted him uh, pro I, well, <laughs> I didn't i haven't muted him no, as he arrived he's doing very good, but these little rosettes are the breathing feeding bits of sponges which are inside the rock. So this is a piece of chalk filled with sponge. So sponge is always filled with something, holes or chalk. It's all very complicated. Further out, you get breadcrumb sponge and you get wacky great lumps of it like this. So you can see this is just an, an awesome piece of sponge. And, and you can see- probably about two feet across. Isn't it? Yeah, a couple of feet across, more than a foot high. Um, and on a piece of chalk that's half a meter high. So there's some really fun reefy stuff out there and the life just builds up. So crabs living together shamelessly, <laughs> more horn rack, more spiral bryozoans and loads of little cute pretty things in, in, inside. And lobsters living under the plates. What the hell is this worm? Oh god, I can't remember. It's this was a worm that was new to us this year, and it's the only one that I've ever seen. Um, oh, um, it can be a new worm. <laughs> yeah, and this is a new, exciting worm whose name I have not learnt. Yeah. It's in a group all by itself. Yeah, and this is why we'd sell the idea very heavily of taking a camera with you and trying to get good pictures, um, because then you can bring your finds back and share them on Facebook and get them ID'd. Um, has to be said that torch lit pictures and GoPro pictures are hard to ID because the view is super wide and the lighting's terrible. Um, but we'll try with anything, so please give it a go. Um, this is a, a bloody Henry starfish, sunbathing, <laughs> deeper out, and this stuff goes to probably close to 10 meters and then you're out onto sand. Mm. Um, you can just keep swimming, but I think you just get onto sand. Forever. Yeah, <laughs> but that sand border is something that does move. It comes in, it retreats, it advances year on year. So it's always worth a long swim to see what's there. Um, we've been out a kilometre at Sheringham, and some years there's chalk and boulders all the way out there. This is a velvet crab. You can tell by the red eyes. It's called a velvet crab, and that's because of this beautiful, soft, velvety coat on its back. <laughs> As I always say, sort of velvet crabs have the best PR. It's not velvety; it's like stubble. I mean, way beyond Nick Schiller level. This is <laughs> this is designer stubble, um, and the things never swim. I've never seen one swim. They just jump at you, try and nip you, and then run off. Um, towards the limit of this outer chalk. We saw pots last year. I'm sure they'll come in a bit, but they seem to be laid along the end of the chalk. Um, and you can see that if one of these things hits some of this stuff, it'll just knock it off. And so potting levels the chalk, and ideally it would occur outside. Um, the, the pots are laid in strings of I mean, 
half a dozen to 20, I think. And this is an old conventional one. Um, it's, you can see it's a rusty steel frame with net strung over it. Um, these are often plastic coated to start with, but as soon as the plastic coating is broken, they just rust out and the plastic coating is lost. So the plastic coating is some of the most common rubbish along the shoreline. Um, so we'd been speaking to, to fishermen about just giving it up. Stop plastic coating your pots because it's a nuisance. Um, it just breaks off. It doesn't protect your pots for long. Um, there's some other big metal bits off there. I'm not sure what this is. I think it's probably some of the old shore defences. Mm. These are, are long, thin strips bent over, and I think they were used to build up the gravel bank, probably to make it so that it was harder to get tanks and Germans up the beach during the war. Um, further along, I saw this nice stainless steel mm. pot. And obviously these cost more. And I think this might be one of Jim Lingwood's pots, although I think he's given up potting now, um, because he was trying different pots and seemed quite, oh, 10 minutes to go, um, seemed to be quite, re quite calm about trying new things. And so a stainless steel pot without plastic on, you should see how it's corroding and it shouldn't corrode much. These were also interesting because this one had a rust out escape door on it. And the idea of these, although to be honest, it doesn't, I thought I'm, I think this looks like it's cable tied on. This should be a rust out door. And the idea of this is that it should be held in with steel rings. So the pot eventually become something that lobsters can walk in and out of. I think there are hinges here. I think there are steel bits attaching this black plastic to the outer bit. Which I think that tied. could that could be it, yeah. uh, but it's hard to see mm. and it doesn't look like it would rust off quickly no. and it doesn't look big enough for m big lobsters to get out of. Mm. So I bet they could get in but not out. So an advance but not not a panacea. Um, here's the kind of, oh, sorry, here's the kind of anchor you'd find on the end of a string. So often they're handmade out of rebar and these things can be fairly damaging, but they tend to hold still. I've got a couple of chat questions come in. Has anybody tried galvanized? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that the fishermen are very funny about what they do. I mean, you'd imagine that some buy these from Gale Force Marine, and they're just a standard thing that people buy in. Others commission them to be made locally and could have anything they want. Um, so I haven't heard of galvanized. Um, so they are, so normally they seem to rot like anything. Mm. It might be that galvanizing doesn't last very long. Um, and stainless steel seems expensive. I think ideally we'd thought, push them into a mindset where they didn't want to lose these things, so they placed them more intelligently, um, then it was worthwhile investing in sort of better um, pots and the whole rotten plastic and long-term potting damage would be reduced. So a nice piece of mermaid's glove sponge on top of this, probably flint, because this is a big ring, or at least a horseshoe of stone, it's probably what they call a paramudra, a pot stone, and that's been freed from the chalk. It's about 60 million years old, um, and it's got a nice mermaid's glove sponge on it. And getting towards the end, I included this because this is a helter-skelter hydroid, and this picture that Dawn had taken down it meant you could see how the branches of this thing helter-skelter down the stem. I don't know if I included the other picture. Let's move on and side. see if the other picture <laughs> Oh, Ooh. some more squid eggs. Yeah, the other kind of squid, Allotuthis. Yeah. yeah, so these are glassy clear and you can see the little sort of tiny marble-like bobbles inside. They're probably that one's got babies. Four, I mean, four millimetres across and you can actually see some shiny bits and those are the little squid inside. I've got some fantastic pictures of that off Wayborn as well. I know you have much better than that. OK, we'll do a talk on interesting animals later. Um, here's a piece of chalk which has suffered a pot strike. So 
this kind of scrape and surrounded by shattered chalk is what you'd get from a, a pot being dropped. And there's going to be a certain amount of damage. What you'd look for with these pots is for them to be laid so they don't move and they're not dragged about on the surface, that they're deployed quickly and decisively, and then they're recovered quickly and decisively and not dragged along the coast. Here's a nice elegant anemone. Mm. Oh. No, that's a, that's a Sagatia troglodytes anemone. Doesn't have a common name, unfortunately. No. It's it's on rock, but it's rock that's covered in sand and silt, so it's got something squishy to sit in, and that's what they like. No, so the elegants like rock, and the troglodytes like, like, a, bit like a bit of sediment. There you go. Ah, ah, here's the other bit I knew I thought I had. So you can see how the sort of fronds or blades of this hydroid, because this is an animal colony, helter skelter down this long stem. So there you are, you're being forced to learn stuff you didn't want to know about. Um, so a helter-skelter hydroid, a nice easy one to remember and easy to recognise. Um, this is fishing waste, this is the thing we see quite a lot where people just dump fishing waste over the boat. This isn't so bad, sometimes it's a horrible midden covered in mould and again that's a thing we'd like to discourage. And sometimes it's in bin bags that have been tied up, that's really yeah, yeah, sometimes bin bags, uh, as, as per household rubbish, dropped in just to be out of sight, not to be properly disposed of. Some crabs, again, around a pot strike, that sort of sharp white cut in the chalk. A hermit crab, and this is covered in hermit crab fur. And you see all these little white heads around it are hydroids. No, I've mucked that up, but they're little hydroids, like little... Jellyfish on a stick. Jellyfish on a stick anemones, coral polyps, it's all the same kind of stuff. I'm rushing slightly because we're going to get to the end. Mm -hmm. This is a masked crab and again these are a thing we see almost only at Weybourne. Um, Overstrand is the other good place for no, A sandy site, so Overstrand's a sandy site, one end of the reef, Weybourne's a good one here and you can see that they bury themselves in sand and have these two pointy antennae on the top. So that's a fun thing, a masked crab. And more jellyfish because we're heading back to the coast. There's Dawn beetling away, swimming powerfully back um, over some of the low scoured chalk and up the beach. And one of the things, particularly at Weybourne, you hear because it's so steep is the waves pounding on the beach, which is a reminder that you're going to have to come up pretty soon. But it's disproportionate. It tends to uh, really scare you when there's plenty of um, noise from waves coming along. Let me see how long have we got. Uh, we've got three minutes to go so I'll try to wind this up quite quickly. Nick has said galvanizing is very cheap and effective. I'm sure it is and I think powder coating would just chip off and once it's chipped you've got a start of corrosion and that's what happens to the the plastic coat. I see Nick's gestures and I think <laughs> I think he's saying it's okay, and it's, it's not the other one where you use a, a ring formation. Excellent. So thanks ever so much, everybody, for coming along. Um, we'll do another one of these next week. Or somebody encouraged... Was this, was this Kerry Lewis driving, drive, driving Cumbrae near Roe Ferry? So that's okay. more. No, we will. We will. <laughs> of, of, obviously we will. So thank you, every very much everybody for coming along it's been been good fun um we've got a camera thing which is six o'clock on friday and more fun chat on this kind of thing next wednesday which we've yet to decide where it'll be i should put up a poll again shouldn't yeah we'll do another we'll do another poll we'll probably do i mean maybe I mean, three four of these so this is the second and then we'll have a general animal talk and then we'll start for some sites again so we'll fill in the whole coast as we go along. So thanks everybody for coming along. We've got just under a minute to go. Oh, thanks Claire for coming. Thank you for your thank you. Um, if you've got any questions, you can always ask them on the, the Facebook group. Um, if this hadn't run so long, we'd have a bit of an open session, but we'll leave it here because I think people have had enough. I'm hungry. This should be fun and we're hungry. <laughs> um, so thank you all for coming. Nice to see you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.